So I have to say I'm really excited to be here. Um, the GNOME community is the one that brought me into open source, introduced me to open source, and I mean, it's a great community. I've always, always been really excited to come back, and uh, so when Paul asked me to speak, I was like, yes, I get to go, go to Guadic. Um, and I think my manager saw I was so excited she couldn't possibly say no. Um, so what I'm gonna talk to you today about is, um, when I talk about open source software to people in business or to people who don't know open source software, their first question is like, they do that for free? Like, you know, it's just incomprehensible that somebody would do it for free. And so I wanted to talk about why people do it for free and how money might change their motivation. And I'm gonna take you down a journey that I went down. And to be honest, if I gave this presentation, if I'd given it three weeks ago, it would have a different ending. So I'm still evolving how I feel about this. If I give it three weeks from now, it might have a different ending based on the questions or the points that you guys tell me at the end of the talk. So if it would go to the next slide. I was all excited the projector works so well. Well, I was gonna introduce myself. Um, just be, I, I don't wanna spend a lot of time talking about myself, but I think it's interesting because I came through, this is really odd. Because I came through the, the GNOME community. So I was actually managing the desktop team at HP, so the CDE team um, in 1999. Oh, maybe that's the problem. Sorry. I'll play with it one more minute and then we'll try to wing this. Okay, I'll wing it. You know, I thought to plug it in, I didn't think to try to walk through it. I'll just start talking and then I'll get it back up. Um, so I got started in, in, uh, in the open source because I was managing the desktop team at HP, the CDE team, so the Unix desktop. And when I inherited it, I had 30 engineers in India and I had two in the States. And all we could do was fix defects in CDE. All we could do was keep up with the problems that customers were finding and we couldn't add any of the new features that anybody wanted. Um, we couldn't add, at the time, they wanted some kind of office-like application. Um, we, couldn't we couldn't add it. We didn't have the resources. With those 30 people, now it's telling me that my password is incorrect. and I didn't put it on a thumb drive like I said I was going to. Well, this should be interesting. I haven't given this talk before, so I kind of wanted my slides to walk me through it. So I was managing this team. We couldn't do anything except fix defects, and I, th I thought this was a crazy situation. And to be honest um, with you, my first inclination um, wasn't, to, wasn't to go to anything else. I thought my first inclination was this is crazy because we have a manager in the States who's managing a team in India. And if the managers just sat closer to the problem, they would see how ridiculous this is to have 30 smart people writing code for, when all else fails, um, writing code um, that's just fixing defects. And they told me absolutely no way. Um, I couldn't hire, I couldn't give my job away to somebody in India. I thought, you know, if we just give the management to India, India can manage the desktop. There'll be a whole team there. They'll be responsible to see the problem. So I started looking around, and 1999 was when Linux was first starting to become really popular. And I saw Linux, and it had a desktop. It not had just one desktop, it had two desktops. And they were great. They had a lot of the features that our customers have been asking for. They didn't have some of the bugs that we had. Um, they had open office, which you know did all of the office stuff that Microsoft did that our customers wanted. And I said, well, let's just use that. Um, well, it turned out to be a really easy technical problem. Um, we worked with Zimian at the time. They ported um, GNOME to HPUX. Um, and then I discovered that it was much more of a business problem. Um, I had people coming to me and saying, you're gonna accidentally copy left HPUX, you know, you got this GPL stuff on there, um, we can't do this. And so I've, by the time I'd convinced management that it was okay to put GNOME on HPUX, I had worked myself into a new job. 
Um, I was getting calls from all around HP about what is this open source software stuff, how can we use it. Um, I was talking to HP customers, HP partners about it. And so I, I did something that was an excellent career move for myself and uh, created the open source program office at HP and, and moved on to a new job. Unfortunately, it wasn't the best career move for GNOME um, because the guy that took my job on the desktop team um, didn't end up putting GNOME on the actual HPUX CDs. So if you get HPUX from HP pre-installed or on CDs, um, GNOME's not the default. And I still feel really badly about that, I have to say. Um, but you can run GNOME on HPUX. Um, so then I wanted to ask you guys, my system seems to have shut me out of my own system. Wow. And I was going to put it on a thumb drive and I didn't. Um, so I wanted to see a show of hands um, from the audience. How many of you um, get paid to work on GNOME or any other open source software? So how many of you here actually make a salary um, working on open source software? Wow, that's a huge show of hands. Okay, and how many of you think, if you didn't get paid, that you would continue to work on open source software? How many of you think you would continue to work on the same piece of software? Because I heard a lot of people say, well, I probably wouldn't do the same thing. I'd probably start something else because it would be funky. Okay, so about half of you, maybe. That's a rough estimate. Um, so the, the, the study I read, and I don't even remember where I first saw it, said that if somebody was working on something for intrinsic values because they liked it, they enjoyed it, they got some kind of reward that wasn't monetary out of it, if you then started to pay them for it, if you stopped paying them, they would stop working on it. And I went, whoa. You know, I, I've spent the last seven years trying to talk companies into using open source software, and I may have just done the open source software community a huge disservice because if those companies went on, all these people would stop working on it. Now, you know, we didn't put GNOME on HPX and you guys are all still here, so maybe I don't have as much power as I thought. But it was a scary thought. And I thought, well, I better start thinking about this. And I took a job at OpenLogic a year and a half ago. And I've been creating our OpenLogic expert community where we're trying to pass on some of the revenues from open source software to the community. Um, so we actually have a model where we support 300 open source software products for enterprises, for large companies, Fortune 500 companies. And when they call in with an open source question, um, we, we triage it, we answer most of them. Most of them are, are kind of stupid. You know, probably most of the community wouldn't want to answer them. And then we pass on the real issues, so the real problems, the real bugs. We have a, a group of experts that we've signed up, um, and they help us solve it. If it's a bug, they fix it, they check it back into the source code. And so we're passing on revenues. And I surely didn't want to set up that, so I'd be corrupting the community. Um, it was really frustrating. But I, I remember how it goes. <laughs> so um, I started looking around to see what, what was out there. How do you, how do you figure out? Um, you know, there's not a whole lot of cases where an open source software project has been around, someone's gotten paid for it, and then someone stopped paying for it. I mean, I think like Easel or a few others are probably the only projects I could find that fell into that boat. Um, but I thought the first thing you ought to look at is why is open source software successful? Um, why are people working on it? So if you look at open source software, there's tons of projects that have been successful without being paid for them in the beginning. You know, the Apache web server, um, Linux, you know, all of them started out, GNOME, that nobody was paying for those projects and they became successful projects. And then granted, there's been companies around open source software that have also been really successful. So there's been companies, you know, you, you, you know all of them, there's, there's tons of them, from MySQL to, you know, to the big companies like Novell that are, you know, there's, there's lots of models around open source software, but open source software is still very successful. Um, and so then I looked at what makes it successful. And I had a bunch of pretty pictures with graphs and stuff I could show you. Um, but there's things like, I looked at, um, is it because of the structure of a project? And it's not. Um, th there's actually a study, and I'll put my slides online so you can see them, that looked at how centralized or decentralized these are projects. So I had like curl compared to another one. And, you know, curl's like one person in the center and everybody talks to that person. And this other project has like 50 people all spread out and there's a lot of interactions between the people. So it really wasn't the project structure. Um, so then I looked at, is it, um, you, you can look at a number of factors, and, and there wasn't any obvious ones, but there's been two studies, um, which I could actually show you the URLs for. Hey, you know, the great advantage of this is you guys can't be typing in the URLs while I'm talking, because I can't show them to you. Um, <laughs> but they're, they're mostly out of MIT, um, two studies about what motivates people to work on open source software. And there's four or five primary motivations that they found. Um, one is that it's intellectually stimulating, um, so that it's actually something challenging. 
And I think if you look at this room, you know, if you read Hackers and Painters, I mean, the people in this room, we're here working on software because we think it's really interesting, because that's, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you're interested in investigating. Um, it had to be something you were learning, um, had to be challenging. Um, they, one study did, were there any external factors that mattered? Like, did it matter if, um, if you paid someone? And they found there was a little bit of people working on open source software to improve or advance their career, but that didn't seem to be the primary factor. Um, and I, I had a personal experience. I had a friend who was going back to get her master's degree because she wanted to change the field of computer science she was in. And so she actually quit her job, went back to school, paid I don't know how much money out to get a master's degree, and I spent I don't know how many hours trying to convince her that she should just start working on that project in open source software. And you know, she would build up those skills much cheaper. She'd have many more hands-on skills and she would get a job. And I wasn't successful. So I don't think many people go into open source software because, I think I'm gonna give up, but let me try one more time. Hey, it's letting me log in. Um, so I don't think many, a show of hands, how many of you went into open source software because it was something interesting versus you wanted to learn something for a career, like specifically? So how, versus interesting? Yeah, so the whole room pretty much. And how many people did it because they actually saw a career opportunity if they learned something? Okay, so a few people. You did both? All right. <laughs> so you were thinking ahead. Um, then there's an, a lot of other reasons that I usually give to companies um, when I talk about open source software and mo motivates people. And, and I, I seem to be going around in a circle around what I was trying to say. Um, but I would talk about it's things like, um, it's, things like uh, it's a meritocracy. So if you, you work on something interesting, you learn stuff, you show how cool it is, and you get recognized by your peers, um, by your skills, by the, the things that you created. And I read Hackers and Painters, Hacker and Painters by Paul Graham. How many have read that book? Okay. So it, it, he talks a lot about how um, writing software is like art. And he talks about how he was a nerd in high school and how people who are nerds or geeks in high school are that way on purpose because they don't want to spend the time that it takes to be cool. Um, they want to spend the time that it takes to answer interesting problems, not on wearing the right clothes. And, and I think that that really made sense because in open source software, it's a meritocracy and you get recognized for doing cool things, um, not for wearing cool clothes. And I think if you take a look at the people who are really famous in open source software, um, they probably wouldn't have gotten into the movies or been famous for another reason. Um, oh, this might just work. So then I talk about, and I spent a lot of time, and I didn't realize I was almost touching it, I spent a lot of time talking about how people are in open source software because it's a volunteer job and you get to pick what you want to work on and you get to work on interesting things and it's very transparent. Um, so, and, and I spent a lot of time trying to talk to companies about how one of the reasons that open source software, wow, this is really weird. I have a confession to make, it's Windows. It's my work laptop. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just show it this way. Yeah, at least it'll be up there. So I spent a lot of time talking to them about transparency and how, and I try to explain it in terms of mailing lists. You know, I say when there's a decision made in open source software, it's, okay, so now you can see it's Windows, I was trying to hide that. Um, so actually, here's my cool graph about the different project structures. Um, that's a really interesting URL um, if you want to follow it and look at a whole bunch of other papers. Oh, it's also not project size is a point I missed. Um, so one of the things I thought, maybe open source software is really successful because there's just like three or four people that get together. And if you only have to manage three or four people, uh, maybe it can be more successful than at a large company where I have like a team of developers and a project manager and another team over here. Um, open source software ranges, as you all know, from projects with only one person working on them to projects like GNOME with hundreds of people working on them. And so the key is the people. So then I talked about what motivated people. Um, I talked about these studies. And here I'm on meritocracy. Um, this is actually the first Guadic that I went to, Guadic in Copenhagen in 2001. Um, and I'm in the picture. If you can find me, I'll give you a prize because I can't find me, but I remember standing in it. 
so it's interesting problems. Um, the other point that it is, is open source software is really successful because you have instant access to the users. Um, the users are usually the people writing the software, and this gets into the transparency issue. So every decision in open source software is made on a mailing list, or it's made in IRC. It's made somewhere that everybody can see how it's made and how it's done. And I've been spending a lot of time trying to c convince companies that that's really the way they ought to run their software internally. Um, because for anybody who works at a large company, you know when a decision gets made, especially on a piece of proprietary software, um, it gets made in a meeting room. It probably gets made by a bunch of managers. Perhaps they called in the lead technical engineer. They probably didn't call in the whole development team. And they make a decision, and then they go back and tell the development team. And that whole process, that whole thought process, is just gone. So now the engineer's stuck with this decision that's gotten made. He doesn't like it. He doesn't know why they made it. He doesn't have any way to argue it except with his direct manager, who has to then defend the rest of the team. And he or she probably can't remember all the arguments that were made. Or maybe those arguments weren't even made. So I spent a lot of time trying to convince companies that this transparency could really help improve their process. And it meets with a lot of fear. I mean, it meets with fear in the company because they think it's going to take forever. I mean, if you went to Ann's talk on consensus, um, that process sounds like it takes a really long time. And managers think they just don't have time to deal with that. You have to make a decision and move forward. Um, and, and so I think I was touching on what I was about to get to. Um, but I think that the key is that without that transparency, without that buy-in from everyone, you don't have everybody on the team making smart decisions. Um, so if you don't know why it was supposed to be purple, um, when you decide to make the font size, you know, you make it the wrong size because they decided it had to be purple because it was going to go to people who had some kind of visual problems, and you pick a font size that doesn't match. That's a terrible example. But if you don't know why the, the decision was made, you make a whole bunch of decisions after that when you're designing and implementing the product, and, and you don't have that background. So it's this transparency where everyone can see how it's happening, everyone can have an opinion, um, everyone can just do it. Um, and, and in a way, you know, you, you can actually argue a point forever. I think the open source community is relatively good about if a decision gets made, um, people just follow it. You know, they don't keep arguing it forever. But if you really strongly believe in something, you can continue to bring it up. Um, and I've seen two, two examples that almost sound like the same story in large companies where someone who was hired from the open source community went to work on a team and decisions were made in meeting rooms without him and he didn't agree with them, and so they would come back and tell him, and he would disagree, and he would argue, and he would write papers, I mean, like five, six page long papers that he would share with me, trying to convince them to do it a different way, and the company just couldn't tolerate that, so he got laid off. Um, so there's that kind of disparity. And I'm painting kind of a gloom picture, but I think, is I want to point out that there's a piece missing when we talk to companies about how open source software works, we're missing something that we need to tell them. Um, so I think, so if that's how open source software works, you know, if um, you, get, you work on interesting things, you get to work on what you want, there's transparency, everyone gets a voice. Um, so how, and, and we're worried about money corrupting that model, let's look at how companies are paying for open source right now. So the main types of ways that companies pay for open source are bounties. Um, so they'll say, I want this feature added and here's how much I'm willing to pay for it. Um, payment in kind, so at HP we did this a lot. Um, if we wanted the Linux kernel ported to HP hardware when we did PA risk, um, we actually rounded up a whole bunch of PA risk boxes and said, hey, these are free to anybody on the kernel team who would like a PA risk box as long as they help us port the Linux kernel to it. Um, so people raised their hands and said, sure, I'd love to get free hardware um, if, if it means I just have to do some hacking. And so we sent them out all around the world and people did the work for us in exchange for the hardware. Um, then there's grants. Um, so you know, like Google Summer of Code, in essence, is a grant because you're not paying for work that actually gets done, but you're saying ahead of time, you know, I will give you this amount of money to spend this amount of time working on it. And then there's employment, and I think employment is um, the key one. So a whole bunch of people raise their hands that they get paid for working on open source software. How many people think they fit in the employment category? Most people. Anybody think they fit in one of the other three? Okay, so a couple hands. Be interested in hearing about them later. What? Yeah, if there's something not included, what is it? Contract. I, I almost, I kind of included that in employment, but it, it can be very different. You're right. So by paying, so then by these types of payments um, to open source software, are companies corrupting um, open source software? Um, the research 
the studies that aren't software studies, but the research about pay versus intrinsic rewards um, says that companies probably are corrupting the motivation of open source software developers. So you're all being corrupted. Um, and, and here are a couple of the studies. I'll share them with you. Um, one that's most famous and gets quoted the most is an Israeli daycare study. And they had these parents um, who were always being really late. And if you were late, it was just really embarrassing, you know, and you had to explain it to the teacher, and the teacher's sitting there looking at their watch, and uh, you take your kid home. So they thought, we'll institute a fine. You know, for every minute you're late, we're going to charge you this much money. And so they posted the new policy, and it had the reverse effect that they were expecting. Um, parents all of a sudden started picking up their children even later, um, because now there was a, a fine you could pay, and you didn't have to be embarrassed. And so you could just pay that fine and take your kid home, and it was like paying for a babysitter. And, and the worst thing was, when they stopped the fine, because obviously this was a problem they were trying to fix, parents didn't go back to the original behavior. They continued to be as late as they had been when they were paying a fine. It was like their embarrassment had gone away. And I have to tell you, they didn't charge enough, because my daycare charges a dollar a minute, and I'm always on time. <laughs> so then just a couple weeks ago, um, New York City came out and said they were going to start paying kids for good grades. Um, so and any New York City student, I don't know if it's any student, but for a group of students, um, if they took standardized tests, just if they showed up to take them, um, they would get points. If they got good grades, they would get points, and they would get points for attendance, and they could get up to $500 a year for those three things. And so immediately, you know, this huge uproar, it, um, Barry Schwartz had an article in the New York Times, and he had an interview on NPR um, weeks ago, I guess. And uh, he said that this isn't going to work, it's going to backfire. Because when you add a second motivation, you, you remove the first one. So like when those parents got, had to pay for being late, it removed their embarrassment. Um, so he said um, the, the motivations compete with each other. So he said the problem is that these students aren't being motivated by the excitement of learning or you know, the, the joy of doing well in school. You know, they have no internal motivations. And for the ones that have internal motivations, when we add the payment, they're going to lose the internal motivations. And for the ones that don't have the internal motivations, $500 probably just isn't going to cut it. You know, it's, it's a really hard thing to externally motivate. And he gave a couple of, and uh, Barry Schwartz wrote, wrote um, a good book called The Paradox of Choice. Um, it talks about how like, when you go into the grocery store, there's a thousand different things to choose from, and how that's worse than only having two to choose from. It's, it's worth reading. Um, so he gave two studies um, that he was familiar with like the Israeli daycare study that might also support this. Um, so he talked about a study where nursery school kids um, were given some markers to play with, and they were drawing pictures with the markers. And then half of them were told, you know, they were given like a, a good player award uh, for, for playing with the markers, regardless of what kind of pictures they drew. And the other half weren't given anything for playing with the markers. So then the next time the markers came out, the kids that weren't given anything for playing with the markers played with the markers just like they had before. You know, they drew pretty pictures and did pictures that were just as good as the ones they'd drawn before. The kids that had been given good player awards, they either didn't play with the markers or they drew much worse pictures. So it, it makes you stop and think if you're raising kids exactly how you, what you should tell them when they play with markers. Um, but the reason he gave was that kids draw because it's fun and they like the picture that comes out. It's sort of an intrinsic reward. It's something that comes from inside of them, this picture and this fun of drawing. And if all of a sudden you tell them they're drawing to get a good player award or you know, the approval of an adult, that overweighs and removes the first internal reward. And so then they're only drawing so that you'll say good player. And you know, you know, having you say good player isn't worth half an hour of drawing a really nice picture. The next study he gave, um, probably even more impact to the world at large, although raising our kids is pretty big. Um, they, I, d I don't remember the year this happened. It was like 30 years ago or so. Um, in Switzerland, they were trying to get rid of nuclear waste. And they went around to towns and said, would you be willing to take this nuclear waste? You know, we got to get rid of it somehow. It's your duty as a citizen. Can we put this waste in your town? And when they asked it that way, about half of the people said, yeah, it's my duty as a Swiss citizen. This waste has to go somewhere. I would accept it in my town. So then they thought, well, we'll change it a little bit. You know, maybe people need some incentive to take this waste because only half of them will take it. And so they went around to a different town and they asked everybody, they said, would you take this waste and we're willing to give you a bonus for it. You know, we're giving, willing to give you a financial incentive every year that this waste is here to everybody in the town. And the amount they offered, they said, was about worth six, week, six weeks of pay. So, you know, that's like, what, a 10, 20% bonus 
um, on your salary if your town accepts nuclear waste for everybody in the town. And when that was offered, only 25% of people said they would take it. So now instead of being measured as a good citizen, they're being measured as a financial incentive, and that financial incentive was less motivating than the motivation to be a good citizen. So if you bring this back to open source software, that you work on open source software because you find it interesting, fun, and exciting, and then someone offers you pay for it, if that pay goes away, and you might say, you know, it's not worth my time to work on it for free. Instead of saying, it was worth my time to work on it because it was fun. Um, but I, I actually wanted to say that I bet if people, I, and I talked to a number of people that say, I probably wouldn't work on the same project. It sounds like GNOME, very dedicated to GNOME, and you guys would all stay. Um, but a lot of people said, you know, if I was getting paid to work on the Linux kernel and my job went away, I'd probably still work on open source, but I probably wouldn't work on the Linux kernel because it would just kind of be too weird um, that I got to spend a lot of time on it and now I don't get to spend time on it. So, the, but the real question to me isn't, you know, isn't would you, an individual, stop working on it because you know if you're motivated and what your motivations are, but what should companies be doing to make sure they don't mess with the system? Um, so, you know, if companies want to hire people to work on open source software and they want to reward, you know, Open Logic wants to give payment to these people that are fixing our customers' bugs because we're getting paid to fix them, what do we do to make sure we don't do the wrong thing? Um, so I think instead of looking just at how companies pay for the use of open source software, um, you also should look at how companies are currently using open source software. Um, so companies, there's companies around open source software, and although there's a lot of them, I think they're the minority in the, when it comes to the grand scheme of open source. You know, so there's companies um, like Red Hat, MySQL, that have kind of grown up around a project and they support and offer services around it. Then the majority of people, like 99% of all companies that use open source, probably just use open source software in their IT environment. So these are the open logic customers. So they're not really involved with the open source community. They're not really giving lots back to the open source community. I mean, they, they probably give back bug fixes and stuff, but they're, they don't have developers working on these projects. They're just using the software. And then there's probably quite a few that use open source software in their products. So they develop, you know, they're a bank and they develop an online banking system or they're an ISV and they have a piece of software they sell and they use open source either in the development process or in the product. And I think the problem, the real problem is that they're using this open source software exactly like as if it were proprietary software. So to them, it's no different to use Linux than Unix. So once they've decided that, you know, GPL isn't going to corrupt their company and, you know, take all their money and give it to somebody else, um, then they're okay with it and they use the product just as if it were proprietary software. Which, which is okay, but I think you need to know it's different. And, and the difference is a key point that I haven't been pointing out to companies. Um, and I discovered this over Fourth of July week. I was reading a book called The Whole New Mind, while right, white brainers, I just spelled brainers, I guess, will rule the future. And in it, he says, up until now, in the knowledge age, um, left brain work has been really prestigious. You know, being a lawyer, an accountant, a software engineer, you know, anyone who can really think analytically, you know, they're more intelligent, they're, you know, they get paid a lot more than most people. You know, that's the really cool stuff to be working on. And we've all been riding the wave of this. I mean, if you're in software, it's, it's a cool thing to be in software. And it's good because you can think logically. And he says there's something changing that model. And his three things he gave were abundance, Asia, and automation. Um, so by abundance, he th says things are really cheap now. Um, so if, if you go into Super Walmart in the U.S., I'm sure you guys have some equivalent store, clothes are really cheap. I even walk through the mall here. You know, you can buy a pair of pants for 5 or $10. Um, you can buy a whole outfit. You can buy um, things that I couldn't have as kids' toys, you know, cost a dollar or two. How can I not buy them for my kids now? Um, and, and there's lots of them. So no, you know, if you, if you have a good job, like a software engineering job, you're probably not wanting for any material thing. And not only are you not wanting for it, there's lots and lots of choices. So, you know, if, if you go to buy um, chairs and tables for your dining room, you could spend weeks just picking out which one you wanted. And then he said the other thing that's changing it is Asia. So we're outsourcing a lot of work to Asia. So all of these really left brain thinking, um, like accountants are just chugging away at code um, to spec, you know, those can be done in India for a lot cheaper now. Um, so you ha we have to do something more. Um, so if you can just hire someone somewhere else to do it for a fifth of your salary, you have to do something different. And then automation. Um, so things are being done automatically now that you used to have to have someone with a left brain thinking to do. So, you know, you used to, if you were a software engineer, you used to write code. 
Well, now a lot of the code is like automatically generated as you kind of describe what you want. Or you, know, you no longer need um, a software engineer to write database, hap database reports um, because the database admin now has a, you know, now has a, you know, the person in their office now has an interface where they can actually write a database query themselves and they don't need a SQL expert to like type it up for them. Um, they can just drag and drop the fields they want and it prints out a report. By the way, I always tell anyone who has a really boring job and they do the same thing day after day, I'm like, find an engineer who's a really good software developer and uh, give it to them to do. And I'm like, by the end of next week, it'll be all automated. <laughs> it works, it works really well. <laughs> you, you just have to convince them that their job won't go away if they do it, that you'll find something else cool for them to work on. Um, so so in, in his book, Dan Pink talks about, um, it goes from that, we start out with the agricultural age, farmers, we went to factory workers, that was kind of the cool new thing, you know, you can make a thousand cars in, in a week or whatever. Then we went to knowledge workers, which is where most of us think we are today, where, you know, anybody who can work with information or programming or accountants or lawyers is really cool. And we're moving into the conceptual age. So we've gotten really good at that left brain stuff, and we're moving into this age where it's more cool to be a creator or a designer. And what does he mean um, by design? Um, so if things are abundant, they're automated, um, they're all sent to Asia. I know Asianized isn't a word, but it had to match the other three. Um, you know, th think about it. When my, my parents go out for coffee every single night, and they go to Starbucks. They don't have a cup of coffee at home, they go to Starbucks. And what they're going to Starbucks for is the experience of Starbucks. They're going there because they like a coffee shop, you know, they like the chairs they sit in, they like the people they talk to. So they're not buying a cup of coffee, they're buying an experience. Um, if you go to buy furniture for your house, you don't just want a sofa and a coffee table. You want like the sofa and the coffee table that's you, that you know, that you want your friends to come over and say, wow, that's a cool sofa and coffee table. And he talks about how design has two concepts to it, high concept and high touch. And so high concept is the ability to like see the bigger picture and to see a pattern and to kind of paint a story about where the world is going. And high touch is adding purpose and meaning. And I think if you look at a lot of the blogs out there, um, there's a lot of people looking for these things. Um, if you go to like Kathy Sierra's blog, it's all about design. It's kind of that high concept. If you go to Steve Pavlina's blog, if you believe him, he makes like $10,000 a month off of it, um, or more, lots. Um, it's all about purpose and meaning. How do I find the purpose and meaning in my life? And uh, Michael Tiemann just blogged day before yesterday on design and how Red Hat starting to include design and how they do things. And he has a bunch of really great links to design blogs and uh, to books. There's like 10 or 15 books listed there. And so I think when I read that, I was like, that's what's in the open source model that's not in the proprietary software model. You guys are all designers. Um, when I was listening to all the lightning talks yesterday, um, so I was listening to the lightning talks, and you guys were all describing new projects, things that you had thought up of, new ways to use things. They were new designs. I mean, granted, you had hacked up some great code and you had great demos to show, um, but the really cool thing was that you had thought of that new thing and you had designed it. And so I think when I'm describing the open source model to companies, I talk about how it's transparent and there's all this email and you know, everybody works on it what they want to and all that good stuff and it's a meritocracy and you know, people kinda, you know, get, to get recognized for what they do. Um, but what we leave out is that you guys are designing the software, every single one of you. And you design it, you hack it up, you bring it here, a bunch of other people come up with comments and questions, and you, know, you go out to the bar and you're talking about how it should work, and I could add this other thing, and it's all about designing it. And I think when we take open source software into the enterprise, we stick it right into that old model. Um, so in the old model, you had some software engineers, not developers, some software engineers, and then you had a product manager, and you have a UI person, and you have a QA person, and you have all these people, and everybody has their job, and by the time writing software comes around, the software developers handed the spec, these customer requirements, and they're expected to write the code like that. That doesn't usually happen like that. They start writing code, and it changes, and it tweaks, and it doesn't usually come out in the back end like it went in the front end. Um, but that's the model. The model isn't that a software developer comes up with a cool new idea, hacks it up, and then sees if customers like it. It's very much customers are supposed to tell us what they want, product managers are supposed to kind of interpret that, figure it out, um, and then give it to the software team to work on. And I think that's what's really missing when it comes to companies using open source software. And it really hit home because I think I've seen this happen to several open source software developers who've gone to work for companies. And they didn't know how to express what they were missing. And they were missing that design piece. Um, they didn't like being left out of it. 
or maybe it wasn't even really being done, they were just supposed to write some code that fit what a customer asked for. And in most companies that you work at, you can submit ideas, but it's not, you don't get to go to the mailing list and type it out and everybody who's interested reads it and argues with you. You have to like make some PowerPoints. When I was at HP, um, nothing was real. And I'm not, HP does a good job of letting developers be designers. But nothing was real unless it was in PowerPoint. Um, and, and you never got to present those PowerPoints. You just wrote the PowerPoints and then you mailed them to everybody and everybody opened them up and looked at them on their own machines. And I must not have been doing a very good job at it when I first became a manager because my manager came over and he brought me this three ring binder that was all printouts of different slides from different presentations from different projects and he goes, these are my best slides. He goes, study them. And so I had this three ring binder of random slides from random projects I knew nothing about that had lots and lots of pictures and graphs and I was supposed to make slides that looked like that. Um, so, so what do we do? You know, if, if the problem is that we're bringing open source software into companies, but we're not really changing the companies to be more like open source software, and, and yet you guys are embodying the future, you know, where software developers get to be designers, um, what do we do? So I think if you continue to do what you're doing, and I couldn't decide if it was designers as developers or developers as designers, but you got the picture, you're both. Um, and then we need to show organizations that writing code isn't all a left brain activity, that people that write code, um, I think the impression is people that write code really aren't your typical end user. You know, they're these really geeky, savvy people, and of course they write these programs that nobody else could use because, you know, they can't, they just can't imagine anyone couldn't use it. I think we need to kill that myth. Um, and we need to share with them how design happens as the code is written. I mean, Hackers and Painters, he talks about your first time you go through code, it's like a sketch, and then you go back through and you go back through, and you're always changing and you're always tweaking it. And to always change it and always tweak it, you shouldn't have to go up three layers of, of corporate bureaucracy and get approval from a product manager who's not even looking at the code. And then that transparency is necessary. So there'll always be decisions made by managers that don't always get made by everybody working on the project. Um, the idea of consensus, I, I don't see that pervading the enterprise for a long time. Um, but it should be transparent how those decisions got made and what those decisions are. And, and I think I think sometimes the best way to get in is to kind of creep it in the back door, just start doing it on your team and then letting people see what it's like when everybody can see the decisions. Um, when I ran, was at HP and the Open Source Review Board, we shared the results of the Open Source Review Board with the whole company. So if we approved or disapproved something, anybody in the company could log in and see that. Um, so that they had visibility into what we were doing and how we were thinking about open source software. And then we need to explain that open source is different because of the people. Um, you guys aren't individual plug and play components that, you know, I can take you and put you on the KDE team and you do just as good a job there. Um, you're here because you're passionate and love what you're doing and you have ideas about where this is going. Um, and so I think that is primarily my presentation. Um, so I'm, I'm open to questions, responses. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry. If you'd done this talk three weeks ago, you said it would have had a different ending. What would the different ending have been? Yeah, so I hadn't read uh, Dan Pink's book, so I wouldn't have used the word designer. So I would have talked about how it was transparency and mailing lists and letting people be involved in the process. And, and I, I had got that developers need to, developers need to be involved in, in the design, but I hadn't got to developers are the designers. Yeah, there was one comment about motivators uh, that uh, they are only, not only thing that people need for living because I have worked open source something about more than 20 years and I have started uh, commercial companies making something closed source and then make open source in free time and I had very little time and uh, if you don't get paid you need anyhow earn your living by somehow and this may limit your possibility to do the open source. So there is some balance you need anyhow. Uh, open coders need to eat also. And then I worked uh, about subcontracting something about 10 years and now few years and Nokia get paid daily salary. And I don't think that uh, it only corrupts, but it also, it's much more easier to do the thing when you know that you get your living. I agreed. And so everybody needs to eat. And so until you meet that need, I think it's hard to build anything on top of that. 
Um, so, so there's actually been a number of studies on happiness. And they say once you have enough money for food and clothes, then you're all pretty much equally happy whether you live in the third world or you live in you know, the developed world in the richest mansion. There's very little difference once you have enough to eat and live comfortably. But until you have that, absolutely you need money. I, I can repeat your question, I can probably hear you. Just a simple note that there may be other problem with being employed as a open source programmer. Uh, there is a joke among Czech Christians that the best way how to lose a faith is to study in seminary. Because, and that's, part of that is that some schools are just bad, but uh, the other part is that it's just very different to work because you want and uh, to work because you just are ordered to have it next Friday to be done. Uh, and it's, it does, yeah. And, and there were a couple studies I didn't include on how if you pay volunteers for what they're volunteering to do, you're kind of the same idea, that it doesn't, and if you stop paying them, then they stop doing it because it's no longer the, the same. Um, and it's also not the same to be able to work when you want on whatever feature you want versus you know you're, you, you have to put the release out next week or your company won't be able to sell it and you won't be able to feed yourself. Um. Uh, okay, a couple of things. Uh, a friend of mine coined this really nice term for the designer uh, you just said. He called it Imagineer. Imagineer? So, yeah. Cool. <laughs> so it's good stuff. So the other thing I wanted to say, especially some, someone from India, one thing which I find very striking in, uh, in India is when I go to all these entrepreneur meets, people who are starting their own companies, they are the same people who attend open source meets. And I know these people are involved in, in projects and they're working on stuff. So I think there's a very striking similarity between people who are going out there and innovating and starting companies and people who are involved in this movement, which is, which is very striking according to me. I, I, I agree. I think part of it is empowerment. So I think once you realize you can do stuff with open source software and you're doing your free time, then you realize you could do even bigger things with, you know, in the entrepreneurial word, world. And, and I have to say about India, um, so I really don't like the way companies outsource software to India, but I, I think India has a lot of really strong software developers who could do great things if companies would just let them, that are outsourcing work, I would just let them do it. Any other questions, comments? Uh, I was just going to say that with the financial incentives like detracting from the overall like impact, um, even with like advocacy, if you say to like a company you can control the software you're using, you can configure it any way you want, you don't need permission to use it, that kind of thing, and then you say, but it's also free, then when they realize that they need to pay for training or they need to pay for new computers or something like that, then they, a lot of the time they just say, well, it's not actually free and then move away and just forget about all the original reasons about the freedom to use it and the configuration and things like that. Yeah, I have a whole other talk on open source and business and, and open source software isn't free and I think that's a huge misconception. It's free in the sense of freedom but not free in the sense of free beer when you talk about deploying it in an enterprise. Yeah, I just have a question, a really quick question. Uh, I just wanted to know if you've, have you actually seen companies like embrace the open source, uh, like uh, companies that were doing the previous old model and then have moved on to the new, uh, to a new open source oriented model that have changed. Not like companies like Emendio or uh, pretty much uh, any company on, the, on those lists that are open source companies, but the companies that have changed from the old one to the new one? So I, I don't have any company that I know of that, that's changed from the old model to the new model. There are old companies that aren't open source companies that kind of embrace this model. I'm um, like when I was at HP in the software lab, you, you, in the beginning you got to just write software however you wanted because they didn't have all the structure, product manager, UI. I mean they had those resources available but they weren't built in. But I don't know a company that switched from one to the other. I, I don't I don't know the inside of IBM well enough to say, but I can ask people that work there. Yeah, there is uh, then one issue that I noticed is way how the work is done. Who's, who's talking? I'm, sorry. I, I'm, I'm talking here. <laughs> uh, so oh, 
like I said that I have long history open source and then small mm -hmm. subcontractor and then I moved to big company and get complete waterfall model and mm -hmm. this was exactly you said that the uh, specificators does the specs and coders does the coding and lots of meetings but then I noticed when there was a lot of lectures and a campaign to learn agile model I learned that this agile is about same way but how we did open source in small companies, much more natural coders were old so designers and also the, uh, these guys that were old uh, specs writers started to write Python code and uh, mostly the great thing is that some external guy with a good reputation uh, came to say managers that you can increase productivity when you start calling it agile and let coders and hackers hack and not uh, put them just on the heavy process. And I think that it's the same problem if you say it, uh, getting Asia. I think that many Asian companies are using the waterfall. Uh, but when we get the same guys from the same companies to our local office to make agile work, they are really good guys to do the code and they do really good one when they can yeah. use the same methodology so, that we use. So, so I, the Agile model, I think, is one step closer to the way the open source software works because you don't start out with this big spec um, in the beginning. Um, and, and I want to say that I think the developers in large companies, there's nothing, nothing wrong with them. I think they're all very capable, just like the people in India, of, of working in this new model. The model's just not set up. They're not free to do that at the moment. Did the development model change? Yeah, yeah, I would say, I mean, I wasn't there during the Palm OS days. Well, I should, I should take that back. I did some contracting back in the late 90s. Um, but certainly, I would say it's a very collegial atmosphere. Um, lots of internal discussions about things, and management takes a very hands-off approach and lets the developers um, make decisions that don't have a uh, direct impact on um, how the product is, appears to the customers. Cool. Thanks. I, I would say it's not easy to hug our work with many customers at once. And I think that it's still, we're still finding our way in a lot of aspects. Part of it is the management aspect because we have commercial goals we need to meet. Um, but then also there's, there's lots of other technical aspects, either just in the way that engineers interact with each other, as Bob was saying. Um, but also um, that we're trying to cooperate very closely with open source and, and open source sometimes has a different agenda. Or on the commercial side, we need a certain amount of stability um, in certain areas because we have product release cycles and so on. And so it, it's, we're trying to find that balance in trying to satisfy both audiences. And, and, and you make a good point. So as an open source software developer working in your free time, you're answerable to yourself. Um, as a company, you might have made public commitments about releases, but you're also, you're also accountable to your shareholders or your, your investors, so there's other people. So not only do you have to convince the developers and the managers and the whole management team, you also have to convince your investors and your shareholders and all those other people. Um, I think it's worth mentioning as well when we look at the, the categories of remuneration that you indicated, when we look at employment, uh, I guess by that you really meant sort of full-time employment mm -hmm. as well. Um, that can be broken down, I suppose, at, 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 into at least two subcategories, where the things that immediately came to mind are where somebody approaches company X because it's got a good reputation in its field or whatever, and once they get on the inside, company X says to them, okay, we need you to work on, I don't know, the kernel. Uh, because it's in our business interest that we keep the kernel going, or we need you to work on GNOME because it's in our interest that GNOME keeps going. So there's that kind of thing where someone gets into the company and then they're sort of pushed into, right, you are now going to code on this project. Um, you then get a separate thing, which is um, the way the company I work for uh, works, which is we employ people because they work on a certain project. Mm -hmm. So um, we're a free software consultancy. So the actual development is not part of our business model. 
but by employing developers who work on those projects, not only can we use them as consultants, but we ensure that those projects live on as well. So we'll employ people because they work on Postgres, because they work on GNOME, because they work on whatever. And I think it's important that that, you know, the difference between the two is, you know, is, right. it's stipulated. Well, agreed. There's definitely different models of employment. And I've had many interesting debates with my HP friends of what if you took HP and you let anybody in HP work on any project they wanted to. And I understand Google does that a little bit. Um, so maybe someone from Google could talk about that. But what would happen? You know, when we were moving away from the PA risk chip set to the IA64, you know, if, if you let anybody pick where they wanted, would enough people stay on the old <laughs> chip set where you were still selling to customers, or would everybody like migrate to the new one? And, you know, we couldn't actually conduct the experiment because we had to support both. Um, but it would have been an interesting, it, it led to lots of inter interesting discussions. Okay, I think just one more question and then. Um. It's uh, just a comment. I don't want to end all this on a, on a bad note, but I worked at Easel back in the day and after we went out of business, within a year basically no one who had previously been working on GNOME and then went to work at Easel was still working on GNOME. So it's a really big risk because I think we lost uh, a lot of really good contributors. And I don't know exactly why. Uh, I've tried to work out myself why I stopped being involved in the community as much, but um, it definitely happened. Well, I think in, in that case, it probably felt like the company, the company not doing well was a statement of the value of the project, which I think isn't the case, you know, because companies do well and don't do well for lots of other reasons. Well, thank you very much. If anything, anybody has anything they want to add, um, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm interested in developing this further and see if it's a different talk in three weeks. Thank you so much.